Our next speaker is a leading security threat and risk expert specializing in active shooter, workplace violence, and other forms of violence. I would like to see how many of your organizations currently have an active shooter security risk assessment in place. Okay, everyone, go ahead and take a moment to uh, answer the question on your screen. All right, we're actually a little bit more split. Uh, we have 44% who have and about 35% who say that they actually haven't. So this is, this is really good to see that people are actually starting to take this step. Caroline Ramsey Hamilton, risk expert, served on the working group to create a defensive information where warfare risk model for the security of defense for C4. She has worked on risk assessment models for active shooter for PFPA, DOD's technical support working group, creating risk models for nuclear facilities, security for dams and substations, hospital facilities risk models, and medication error models. She has even received the Anti-Terrorism Accreditation Board Lifetime Achievement Award. Caroline will be presenting active shooter security risk assessments, lessons from Parkland, Annapolis, and Jacksonville shootings. Now I'd like to turn it over to Caroline. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, think about your questions while I'm talking. So we're gonna talk about some of these active shooter incidents, lessons we learned from 2018. Unfortunately, now we're having active shooter situation at least uh, once a week and some, some weeks we have them twice a week. It just turns out by happenstance that I live in Parkland. So I was there the day they had the Parkland shooting. I was at the, across the street at the Target store and I had just walked out of the store when I saw three helicopters and 14 emergency vehicles racing up the street. And I thought, oh no, they must have had a horrible traffic accident. And uh, actually checked my, uh, checked my traffic monitor and there were no accidents. So I had to go back to the office, turn on the TV and find out that uh, what had happened. Turns out that my two grandchildren happened to also be in Parkland that day at school at Country Hills Elementary School where they were locked down. They're eight years old. They were locked down from seven in the morning until 6.30 at night in their school. And so uh, I really feel this whole thing now more that I was doing this before, but now I, now I really get it, how, how terrible it is, what a scar it leaves on your community and uh, everything else. So we'll just get going. Here's my background, which you can look at on the slides if you want. But uh, one of the things I always say as a disclaimer at the beginning is that we, everybody on this call knows that this can happen anywhere, anytime. And so this is not anything about gun control. We're not going to talk about guns. It's not about politics. It's not about the NRA. It's not about arming teachers or nurses. It's just about how do you protect your staff, your patients, students, customers, visitors, and anybody else by putting these simple controls in place that prevent and reduce active shooter incidents. And we had a real look at this yesterday because even though the Parkland shooting was on Valentine's Day, February 14th of this year, they, the Parkland Commission is just winding up its, uh, its study, a year-long study on why that happened. And one of the things that they have cited in this 405-page study, which I'd be happy to send to anybody, is that they need to put these simple controls in place right away. So they have waited from February to December to put some of these simple things into place that we're gonna be discussing. If you want to see what's happening, this is a chart that shows it. So it shows you uh, how many active mass shootings we had in 1966. And then it goes up to 2015. And if it could go up, if, if the screen was larger, it could go up higher from there. So it's just basically been a straight line up ever since uh, 2015. These are the mass shootings by state. So we you can see there's an accompanying article that, that says uh, which are the states that have the most mass shootings at California, Florida, and uh, Illinois are the top three. Number four is Texas, and number five is Alabama, and number six is Georgia. So you could see by the concentration that there's not much going, up, going on in Montana and Wyoming, which is unusual because there are guns everywhere there, and also up in the very northern part of the East Coast, too, very uh, not so many. So when I think of active shooter, I think about compliance and liability. That's sort of my mantra. If people comply with the generally accepted security standards and federal mandates in, in the case of healthcare or some other industries where they require these risk assessments, it reduces your liability. Just being in compliance reduces your liability. So some people say, 
I don't want to have a risk assessment done because I don't want to see all the things that we need to fix. But it turns out that if you have uh, some kind of an incident, eventually somebody's an auditor is going to come out and find out why that incident occurred, whether it's a, it's a CMS auditor, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, if you're in healthcare, it could be a transportation board, it could be a insurance audit, insurance auditor adjuster, going to come out and say, what did you do to, to what if, what have you done in the past to make sure this wouldn't happen? And so what you can say is we've done a risk assessment, here it is, and we've analyzed what things are most likely to occur, we've put in solutions for those things, and here's our corrective action plan for the next year that shows what we're planning to do in the next year. And they will say, thank you very much, that works. If you don't do that, they'll, they'll stay, and then they may give you up to a billion dollar fine too. So compliance, this kind of compliance directly reduces liability. It also covers you for the OSHA general duty clause. And there are 33 states now that require you to do risk assessments on violence for uh, to, to meet their standards in the states. And that's going to become a, it's, there's a bill in Congress right now to make that nationwide. And uh, so it's protection for that too, because of course the general duty clause says you as an employer promise to put in place a safe workplace. And uh, that's so this also proves that you've evaluated that workplace and you've determined that it's safe. So one of the common things people look at when they say, okay, we're going to do a threat assessment is let's go get some numbers. So maybe you're going to look at this number and this number is, uh, this is from last January where Parkland had just won the award for the safest city in the United States. It got a crime index, which is the FBI uniform crime index rating of 85, when 100 is the safest, and that means that Parkland on February 1st was safer than 85% of the cities in the United States. Great. So what did they have? They had a, a mass casualty incident the next month. They killed 17 and injured another 17 people. So what some of these statistics, and that's why... I maintain you have to work with a lot of different statistics. You can't just use one. You have to look at what's happening in your industry, what's happening in your type of facility, uh, you know, what what the issues are. And so we have like 10 different elements that we put in place to evaluate threat. It includes industry data. It includes local data like this. It includes the fact that you're in a school and the statistics on school shooters. If it was a hospital, it includes hospital data. So you get a real good look at what's really going on. This just shows you more of the same graph. So this shows you how the green line is the U.S. average and the, the purple is Parkland. So in 2016, that's how far it was down from the national average. And, of course, it happened anyway. This is just a little summary I put together of four different shootings just so you could see. And I used Parkland to start with in Annapolis, in Jacksonville, and then Chicago, which we're all going to talk about. One was a school, one was a business office, one was a retail complex, one was a hospital. They each had different crime rates. So you can see Mercy Hospital in Chicago has an, a crime rate of eight, which means that 92% of the country, cities in the country are safer than Chicago. Jacksonville surprised me with their low rating of a nine. Uh, Annapolis was a little better, but not much. And each of these have a different thing, but you can look and see how many people were injured and killed. The safest place had the most injuries, 17 killed, 17 injured, one shooter. Annapolis had two people injured, six killed, one shooter. Jacksonville, 10 people injured, three people killed, one shooter. Uh, Chicago, one person injured, four killed, one shooter. And time for the police to go in. Well, how long did it take the police to get there? Well, in Parkland, they never went in. In Annapolis, uh, they went in two minutes after it started. In Jacksonville, they went in two minutes after it started. In Chicago, they went in three minutes after it started. And it didn't make any difference at all because everything had already happened. The problem is that by the time you get the alarm, that the, even at the police department, even if it's one block away, somebody's got to run, get their keys, get out of their car, get in the car, drive through traffic to get there. By the time, 90% of the time, this is already over by the time that happens. And again, one data point is just not enough to prevent this. You have to know exactly what your real threat level is by averaging all these things in place. But again, we all know what the threat is, active shooter, and so you have to know what controls you have in place. That's gonna, that's what's going to help and reduce the likelihood of something happening. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, all the active shooter training in the world is not going to help. 
if you don't have the right controls in place and by improving your response, as our two previous speakers talked about, if an incident does occur. So let's just take a look at what went wrong with Parkland. Number one, they had no security controls, even though a month before it happened, a Secret Service agent whose child goes to that school had gone into the principal and said, I'd like to walk through the school and show you what's wrong. Principal said, okay, you can do that. So they did. He put it on a piece of paper, he, and the principal didn't want to look at it himself. He just gave it to two teachers, and they discussed it briefly and never put any of the controls in place. So they had no access control. You could All the back doors were unlocked. You could walk in any in any entrance. And that's how the shooter came in after walking through the unsecured athletic field. Now, they had started to lock the athletic fields, but the morning in question, they didn't lock it. So the guy didn't want to go out there in the cold, so he didn't lock the backfield. The, they had uh, probably 30 different complete threats. The woman who was a relative of the shooter had called, uh, called the Parkland police. They never followed up. She called the FBI, left them a long message, and, and her message to them explaining how he had so much money and all he was doing was buying guns and his mother had died and he put in his Facebook page that he wanted to grow up and be an active shooter and, and shoot up a school. None of that was followed up on. The Broward Sheriff's Department didn't follow up on it, and so that's what he got his wish. The problem here was that school resource officer, infamous Scott Peterson, uh, hid under a column and never entered the building, and they found that on the video after the event. They had uh, four deputies there from the Broward County Sheriff's Office. They were told to stay in the parking lot with their guns drawn, so everybody, five armed officers, sat outside and 17 children were shot and killed inside the building. There were communication problems between the police and the sheriff's office where they were on different frequencies, and they just released all the, all the in, this, in these uh, hearings that they just had, they released all the tapes, and you can hear them saying, I can't hear anything. The other thing is somebody decided that they should leave the crime scene alone, and there were still kids up there who had been shot and were bleeding to death, and they prevented the medical personnel, one of the sheriffs, prevented medical personnel from entering the building initially. So the next uh, incident we're going to talk about is in Annapolis, Maryland, and that is where I used to have my office. And there they walked into a newspaper office. One guy killed five people, injured three. And uh, it was just absolutely horrible. And what he did was he walked in with a rifle. He had uh, his problem was that he was mad at something that one of the editors had written about him seven years ago. And it said that he was responsible for this girl and he was harassing her and she had to move out of the state and everything. And this guy was so angry that it was written up in the Capitol newspaper as an article that he thought about every day. He fantasized about getting even. He wrote journals about it. And then one day he picked up his gun and went to the office. He used a shotgun to, to shoot out the glass front doors. They were open anyway walked inside and everybody was just sitting there open, open area in their desks and he just shot them and it just took a few minutes to kill everybody. And uh, the five staffers and three others were injured. And again, the whole, all the shooting was over before the, before the police arrived. Eventually, they had 105 law enforcement officers on the scene within two minutes, but it was too late. And so, again, they had no security. They didn't have a communication system. They and the but the worst thing about this one was that they had they had seven years of notice, seven years of this guy harassing them, sending them letters, sending out posts, all these things he did, and the newspaper decided not to get a restraining order against him because they thought it would make matters worse. Guy should have had a restraining order, you know. He should have had not been able to get within a hundred yards of the place, you know. He should have. Uh, been put in jail if he continued to harass them, and it was all over really nothing. So what went wrong in, Annap in Annapolis was uh, multiple people were shot as people hid under their desks. There's no place for them to go. He shot through the glass doors. So uh, there's nothing more terrifying than hearing multiple people shot while you're under your desk and listening to the gunman reload looked like a war zone. He said, I'm a police reporter. I write about this all the time. But it's, you know, unbelievable how, how trauma, traumatizing it is. So here, what went wrong in Annapolis? No security controls, no access control, no receptionist, no solid doors. The threat that they've had for seven years was not taken seriously. They didn't have panic alarms. 
There was no case management program, which we'll talk about later, for uh, managing workplace violence. They decided against putting in a restraining order. So again, you know, it was just a typical local newspaper. So let's talk about Jacksonville. So in Jacksonville, they had a big tournament. It was a multi-million dollar, $150,000 prize Madden video tournament. And it was held in a, in a special gaming center that was in the back of a restaurant. It was in a retail complex on the St. John's River. And uh, it was everything was glass and it was wide open. So it was a retail environment. Everything was open. There was no security anywhere. They had no access control to the video gaming rooms in the back where they always held this tournament. The shooter was angry because he had won the tournament the year, a year ago, but had already been disqualified for this year's tournament. So he took a break at lunch and he went back to his hotel room and he got his gun and came back. And the door at the primary entrance, of course, is always open. He just walked right in through the through the front door. He walked into the gaming area, and people, the patrons of the restaurant, had to walk through that gaming area to get to the bathroom. So he just walked right in and started shooting people. He had made threats about him. He had left them on Facebook. They had no panic alarms. They had no way to call anybody. They had no training in you know a retail establishment. They a lot of times they will, unless they're in a mall, will not have active shooter training or anything. So how do these, uh, and then we're going to add one more, which is the Mercy Hospital Chicago tragedy, which really has shocked the security community. So we'll, this was uh, this happened on November 20th. This is a young uh, emergency room doctor, and she's showing up for work at 7.30 in the morning. And uh, her boyfriend pulls up next to her, and he she had just broken off engagement with her. He asked her for the engagement ring. She said she didn't have it. She wasn't giving it back, and he shot and killed her out in the parking lot. And then he ran right into the hospital emergency department, right into the main part of the hospital, where an elevator door opened and a pharmacy a young girl who was a pharmacy resident got out and he shot and killed her. And then he looked around and saw two police officers coming at him, so he shot both of those. Uh, one of them was saved because his bullet hit the holster, the leather holster, and it held the bullet there. It didn't penetrate his body. The other young, young uh, officer was killed. He has three small children at home. He was 26 years old. And so what happened, the, the medical officer was happy to say that he'd conducted an active shooter drill last month. Everybody had been trained. There were 200 people being treated at the hospital that morning, but they only evacuated the emergency room and they didn't lock the doors to the emergency room for outside, even though that was what their emergency plan included. So there was total confusion. There was no good communication. People were reading about employees of the hospital, were reading about this at their desk on Twitter was how bad it was. And it really, again, when a doctor shot, scares everybody. There was no access control. Most hospitals now, especially in a busy city like Chicago, not only do they have to buzz in, but they also have a security officer stationed in the emergency room who's usually sitting at a podium or something. So he can also actively monitor the screens while things are going on. But they did not have active can can any active monitoring, so they couldn't see him approaching the facility. Nobody called to tell them to lock the doors. Their communication system didn't work and they had no panic alarms to scare him off. So what, what, and this, this is a, just a summary of some of the things that, you know, they have uh, really some really good controls now. They have automatic lockdown that a lot of hospitals have where you hit the button, all the doors close. They didn't have that. They didn't have an adequate communication system and they didn't, the police didn't mount an adequate response. In my uneducated opinion. They were two officers who happened to be driving by the hospital when they got the alert to come in. Usually if you have an active shooter who's already killed a doctor out in the parking lot, you would have a, a, a SWAT team or the active shooter group come in who would be wearing ballistic vests, right? And then none of this would have happened. Uh, but they didn't do that. The just first two officers just came right into the hospital. He saw him and he shot him and killed him. Then he killed himself, and then the officer, but he wasn't dead. He he didn't shoot himself quite in the right place, so the officers had to finish off when they got into the hospital. So, again, we know where this can happen. And your office, a law firm, restaurant, churches, schools, malls, hotels, military installations, giant Fort Hood, Washington Navy Yard, hospitals all over the country. So there's no safe place that you can be that doesn't have a potential of being an active shooter situation. And so 
I still believe active shooters should be required annually, that they got to learn how to run and hide and fight. But if you don't have any controls in place, it's not going to be enough. You, can't, you have to protect yourself with these inexpensive controls. This is what you learned with the risk assessment. So the five critical elements that could, could have prevented, you know, 90% of these shootings, some kind of access control at the entrance, having an active shooter risk assessment done, which would have have fixed the communication system problem and a lot of these other problems. Uh, the communication system is absolutely critical. The other thing that I recommend, a lot of people will say to me, uh, you know, we don't, we, we're, we're going to buy this big system. It's going to work on all our computers. That's great. But what are you doing today to help these people? What you need to do is buy these in these individual panic alarms for people who are in the reception areas. They're on a lanyard. They hang around your neck. I have one right here. When I pull this, pull the thing on it, it goes. So I, I take it when I go to the mall. I take it when I go to church. You know, it's a nice to have. It costs. 12 to $15 a piece on Amazon. And so usually that's the first thing I recommend to somebody is just go to Amazon and get 10 of these and give them to the people who are sitting right at the door where a shooter would come in. And it's almost always going to be the front door. I've never seen a shooter come in the lobby, come in the back of the lobby, come in, sneak in through the cafeteria, sneak in through the loading dock or anything. They, they're proud of what they're doing. They're on a mission and they want to come right into the front door. And that's where you need to have the panic alarm. The individual panic alarms do two things. Because it's already given the police aren't going to be there before it's over. The panic alarm, when they hear that loud noise, they know somebody knows what they're doing. And it, sometimes it scares them and they run off. The other thing it does is an instant alert to everybody in that building who can hear from hear, hear within the hearing distance that can say something's going on. We need to hide or get out the back door at that point. So I think they're very valuable. The risk assessment, one of the things that it does is it does it checks that everything's working like it's supposed to. A lot of times we find situations where people think they have controls in place and they're actually not. So I've done about a thousand risk assessments in the last 12 months, many of them in healthcare because of a new healthcare rule that requires them. But uh, one time I'm on the 27th floor of the hospital and uh, they have a, they have a, they have a desk there with three people at the reception and they they say that they have panic alarm. They tell me that, okay, let me see it. Crawl down on the floor into the desk and there's no panic alarms there. They're all taken out because they remodeled the area three years ago. So these people are there working, thinking they have the panic alarm to touch. And it's actually, the counter was replaced with a nicer counter, but the panic alarms just got lost in the, they got lost in the shuffle. The other thing we find is door alarms that don't work. Uh, doors that are left open, doors that have settled a lot of times because of the, just the settling of the building over time. And you, and it's, it's the, the door that goes from the psych unit into the stairwell. And the door alarm doesn't work because it's rust, the contact points are rusted together and the door doesn't work, can't be locked because it's off center. And so it doesn't catch when it closes. And a lot of times we find that because the hopeless people come into the facility at five o'clock in the morning and that's how we find that the door doesn't close and lock anymore unless you have somebody checking on that you're going to continually have problems with that the other thing i'm a proponent of is more cameras because cameras are very inexpensive now compared to how they used to be but if you have all the cameras you might as well have active monitoring and one of the things that drives me crazy when i go out to these facilities is that they have the active monitoring screen showing you know 16 16 parts of the building, the outside, the parking lot, the the roof, you know, wherever else. And it's locked in the IT closet and nobody has a key. So it's like a, an active a active monitoring screen in the IT closet's not going to do any good. It needs to be out in the front. The receptionist with a security or safety officer with the emergency preparedness, you know, hopefully with a, a full command center that might be might be there. So again, these are the things that we want to have is we want to have that risk assessment done up front because not only is it going to tell you what you need to do, but it's also going to give you cost-effective controls. And the federal definition of risk assessment includes a risk assessment has to include a cost-benefit analysis. So that makes sure that you're going to get the most bang for the buck, I'm going to recommend the controls that are going to be the most protection for the least amount of money. 
access control for staff and for visitors. You know, the if you let visitors walk into your and wander through your plant, through your organization, it's not going to do any good. So you have to have a visitor management system. It could be as simple as uh, a book, you know, where you write your name down and and when you came in and turn over your driver's license or passport, you can go in the building and you get it back when you come out. Or as sophisticated as a lot of these great software programs they have now, like a fast pass for visitor management, that take a picture and create a, a badge with your picture on it. And the, the badge automatically expires and turns pink after 24 hours. So if you do get lost or stuck in the building, that they know they can tell instantly that your, your pass has expired. Again, the cameras in active monitoring, the panic alarms that people are have aware wearing at each entrance, all your exterior doors locked 100% of the time. And I also recommend uh, that HR and security work together to create a case management program. And that's what they needed at the hospital when they had the, the, the disgruntled fiance who turned out and we got internal affairs reports from one of the newspapers there that had been written up like 50 times for his terrible attitude and how he kept He'd punch women in the back in the training classes for firefighter. He'd punch them on the side in the back when they walked by. He had a terrible attitude. Should have been taken out and put into one of these case management programs. Issue a restraining order if you have to. Make this guy understand that he's going to get watched forever from now on. Same thing with uh, uh, Annapolis Capitol shooting. Same thing with the Parkland shooting. Somebody who's said that they want to kill people, they have the guns, they have the money to do it, should have been watched, should have had, he had already been kicked out of that high school and was going to an alternate school, but he kept coming back, right? Because nobody wants to get kicked out of a school and he should not have been allowed to come back. He should not have been allowed to be anywhere near that campus. But unless you have a structured program in place to manage that, you're not sure that that's happening. So again, access control is a starting point. If you can't manage who's coming in, you're never going to have any security. The other thing is to limit the entrances. Lock the entrances with a strike bar so you have fire safety people can get out. You can get out just like Hotel California. You can check in, but you can't check out. So no facility, in my opinion, is secure if it has multiple entrances. The door should be locked 100% of the time. Never be propped open and be checked regularly to make sure that they close effectively. Adding more cameras, monitoring aggressively, actively monitoring the cameras, and also monitoring the parking lots. Better communication system. We talked about the panic alarms. Uh, there's great communication systems that put out silent alerts, can automatically notify law enforcement, message, email, text, but the systems have to work. And also it works as a notification after the incidents are open. So this is a little roadmap on uh, what you need to do to keep your organization safe. We publish these free risk alerts that I send out all the time. I just send an amazing one out today. Be happy to share it. If you send me a note to my email address, I'll be happy to put you on the list. They come out about twice a week and they cover emergency preparedness, security incidents that happen in the real world and what the outcome of that. Uh, I highly recommend you do an initial security risk assessment for active shooter that you can use as a baseline. So the risk assessments that we do, we update all the threat information from at least eight different sources, including all your local data. We look at the criticality of the assets you have there with a dollar value and a, a present day replacement value. We survey the staff in detail with web-based questionnaires and phone and in-person interviews to see how where they are and how their compliance level is. And this is how you find out that people have missed the training classes, that they don't know where to report something. All these things you find out by actually talking to people. And then we rate the implementation of the controls and balance that against the cost, the threats, the cost of the potential loss by the cost of putting the control in place. So then we prepare action reports based on return on investment that you're going to present to the board. And that's one of the things in the healthcare, the new CMS rule on emergency preparedness it has to be presented to, has to be in the board minutes. The auditor is going to go look and make sure that the, the board read, heard this presentation and read it. They, they're trying to make that accountability go down to a board level. So this is just a little, this is a continual cycle of improvement. So if you do this one year, you put in the threats, you identify the assets, you survey the staff, 
you find the controls, you evaluate the, the controls, whether they're in place or not, and then creates an action plan. For the next year, you're going to you're going to take that action plan and implement it. So, by the next year, you will have reduced the threats, you will have increased your compliance and the staff because they now know what they're supposed to do. You would be in improving your uh, your implementation of the control. So, for example, one place I went, they didn't have any any panic alarm. So they started right away and they got enough for 50% of the people who needed them. Next year, they got another 20%. The next year, they're going to get another 20%. And that's what these people want to see is this continual improvement over time. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to, you have to go do everything at one time, but you're going to do it as you can. Again, we use real numbers for everything so we can track back and show where every single number came from. And, and we also figure in reputation loss. If you look down there at the last bullet, because when you have a shooting at a school and now Parkland becomes a synonym for active shooter, it reduces property values for years. We also evaluate the percentage of implementation of each of the controls. And these are just some examples of the different controls we use for active shooter assessment. And then we get our uh, cost benefit analysis done so we can see what we need to do how much it would cost and how much it would save us. So what we are passionate about is making sure that you're protected from having this kind of an incident happen to you. So you need to talk to your management about what you need to make sure your organization is safe. Start with an active shooter risk assessment. It's going to give you your best bang for the buck. If you want more information on any of these, you can write me at my email address there on the page. And uh, I want to thank you very much for for participating today. It was great to be able to talk to you and I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Are there any questions? Oh, yep. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, we are now beginning the Q&A session of Caroline's presentation. If you have a question, please submit them through the chat or question box. So, Caroline, our first question is actually, what is the alarm that you're using? I'm assuming oh, the this is a panic, panic alarm. alarm. Yeah. It's a, well, you can get them on Amazon, and so it's called Vigilant. It's called an individual alarm. So you can go to Amazon and look up Vigilant individual alarm, individual panic alarm, and it'll bring up. Cause they, they make them for students and joggers and, you know, all these other people, but they're, they're a great starting point for everything. Okay. Um, are you a proponent of alarm-based camera monitoring to avoid camera fatigue? Yes. Okay. But I'd still rather have camera fatigue than no cameras. But having okay. an having an alarm is great. But uh, in some places that are really really busy, like hospitals, where you have people coming in and out constantly, you know, you can't really have the cameras alarm that way. You, you need to to still have somebody watching them and looking at them, depending on how large your organization is. The other thing is if they're up at the reception a reception or manager's desk. They usually have enough time in their day to monitor a camera and take a look at it. And of course, if they hear a bullet shot, a bullet or anything like that, they can scan the cameras at that point too to see what, what might be going on. Okay. Do you think that some training issues are caused by the inability to, inability to effectively simulate conditions during drills? No, I don't. I don't think that's an issue. In fact, I think tabletop drills in my personal opinion, I think tabletop drills are usually more effective than actual live live drills where you run around outside and hide under things. Because my whole emphasis too is on the front end. I don't want to spend hours teaching them how to hide and climb on top of something and you know get wedges for the doors and all this stuff. I, I want them to not have the incident happen in the first place. And if they have the proper controls in place, they should never be in that situation. But I do think it's important to uh, especially assess the mindset of these people and teach them that the reason that there are 20,000 or how many people, a couple of thousand people died because they didn't understand what was happening to them. There were a lot of deaths in 9-11 that could have been prevented because they really, the people on some of those upper floors, they hadn't been, they weren't killed. The, the plane crashed into the building, but the stairwells weren't damaged below the downward stairwells but people didn't even try to get out. They could have walked out. There was no fire. The smoke wasn't thick. They could have gotten up and walked out and they didn't. We, I read the 328 page report of that 
people crawled under their desk and in 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 the fetal position and just waited for until and uh, unfortunately the building collapsed on top of them people went in the bathroom and threw up people ate the entire contents of the refrigerator but they didn't try to leave because they they weren't empowered so to me the training is get that empowered mindset that I'm going to get out of here and I don't care what's in my way. I don't care if they have a Rottweiler. I don't care if they have a fire. I don't care if there's a stairwell. There is a way to get out. But you have to think clearly. And what happens when these things happen, as uh, somebody else said on this, is you just go into you go in panic, freeze, shut down mode. You're the deer in front of the headlights now. A rabbit that's startled. And I have pit rabbits, so I know. You startle a rabbit, it just sits there like it's frozen in place. It can't move. So you have to shake these people up and make them understand. And once you can get them to the point of understanding what real situational awareness is, it's not a problem. It's not a bad mindset. It's something that's going to save them, whether they're in the nail salon, they're at church, they're at the school picking up their kid. It kicks in all the time. And you're aware of where you are. You know what you need to do if something happens. You have a backup plan basically for 100% of the time. Thank you. How, how do you deal with buildings with numerous entrances where you can't lock all exterior doors to control entrance? I get a buzzer, and I did that in my own building in Annapolis, Maryland. We had a guy come into our office with a gun, and our door was always unlocked, and it wasn't open, but it was unlocked. The guy walked in, and he was waving a gun around. He said, I, I want all your drugs. We said, you're in the wrong office. We don't have any drugs. The, the medical part of the building's up on the third floor. You know, send him up to the third floor, call them, call the police. And the next, that afternoon, we had somebody come in and, and cut a hole in the door and put in a bulletproof piece of glass and put in a buzzer. And so that was the last day we had an unarmed door. Every door needs to have some kind of an alarm on it so people just can't walk in. Okay. Do you advocate, do you advocate for bleed kits and training for people to assist in these types of emergencies? Absolutely. Absolutely. We believe in having those ready kits that are distributed around an area, especially. And again, a lot of the what you're spending is going to go for. It depends on the, the, the threat level that you're at. So if you're in a healthcare organization in a bed, which is already uh, eight times more likely to be killed or shot than a police officer, if you're a, if a nurse, if you're a nurse or in, in 10 times worse than a high-rise construction worker. So if you're in a high-risk profession like that and you have a real high crime rate, right, then it's going to say, okay, what do we need to do first? Again, we're trying to prevent this from happening. So we want to have the, what the, the bleed kits, but first we want to have the panic alarms. Second, we want to have access control. Then we want to have the stop the bleed kits. Then we want to have the automatic, automated tourniquets and everything else. But we start with trying to keep people out. I'm also a big, if you were here, if I was in a room with all you guys together, which I wish I was, I would be walking through the uh, walking through the, the seats right now, handing you tampons. So my, it makes the men really uncomfortable, makes me laugh. We get these little OB tampons and if people just are so, they didn't want to touch them, you know, but if you think about it, what it is, it's a piece of sterile cotton wrapped up in plastic and it just happens to be the same size as a bullet hole. So I always keep those in my drawers. I keep them in my briefcase just to remind me of that I could have a shooter at any time. You can use them to plug a bullet hole. And because they expand, because the cotton's compressed and expands, actually will put pressure on the artery and help stop the bleeding. 